Take your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation. We're doing a series on the church, but in order to understand the church properly, now last week I know a lot of people left with a lot of question marks. That's okay. If you want more information about those subjects in particular, you can come talk to me and I can point you in a good direction or get put material in your hands. But in order to understand what the church is, to really see it in all the beauty that God desires for it is the bride of Jesus Christ. We've got to understand why we are, what we are, when we are. In other words, we have to understand the time of history in which we live in because the Bible is not absent to that. Just because the last writing of the Bible was done in 100 AD, just because it wasn't officially put together and set into motion until around 400 or so AD, doesn't mean that it doesn't have things to say about the future. We believe that the Bible has been given in such ways as to where God wants to be understood, and so he lists it out plainly. That doesn't mean that we discard figures of speech. It doesn't mean that we don't pay attention to certain imagery that's given. It doesn't mean that we're not to use our brains. But it also doesn't mean that we are to take that which is plain and distort it. And so when we talk about something like last week, How do New Testament authors use the Old Testament? How do we understand that? And it's either A, a fulfillment of prophecy, or B, they are taking an Old Testament concept that stands on its own, and they are applying it to a situation that they're presently talking about. Remember, meaning is, does anybody remember? (coughs) Meaning is one. Thank you. Who said that? You get a cookie today. In fact, today is cookie day for you. Yeah, there we go. Good. Meaning is one. Mary just showed all of you up. Meaning is one. Applications are what? Many. They are many. Many applications to a passage. And this is exactly what the New Testament authors are doing. In other words, because the New Testament authors are using the Old Testament in this way, it gives us that principle for how to interpret. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. You're like, no, stick with me. So if we believe in literal interpretation and we believe that things need to be understood just as you would read them, and we believe that as you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you learn more and more and more about God because it progresses at time, as time goes on, then we believe that if the Bible says the word church, it means church, and if the word is Israel, it means Israel. Is that confusing to anyone? Actually, it is. In Revelation chapter 7, read with me please. We're going to start in verse 1. It says, after this. Everybody need to get there? Okay, I'm sorry. I thought I said Revelation 7. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so that no wind would blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending. From the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God, and he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. Now, it's a majestic scene. I know we're picking up in the middle of a prophetic book. It's okay. Hold on to your seats. Because this is a major litmus test. In fact, I'm convinced that if you can't answer the question I'm getting ready to pose to you, you should not be allowed to serve in ministry ever where you teach the Bible, okay? That's pretty strict. Yes, it is. Because I'm pretty fired up about today. Here, hold on. All right. Verse 4. And I heard the number of those who were sealed. 144,000. How many? Are we clear on that? Is that what the plain reading of the text tells you? It is. Now watch this. Sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, Joseph, 12,000. And from the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. What is the identity of the 144,000 that are sealed? Jews. 
from Israel. One of the greatest dangers that threatens the church today, and you wouldn't think it because it's espoused by a lot of well-meaning and popular preachers and theologians, is called replacement theology. Now, if you were taking notes, this would be something to write down. And if you need a little book, a sermon booklet to take notes, raise your hand. We'll make sure and get you one. We have some in the back right up here on just a second here. Did you some? Does anybody else need one? Because I want everybody to have this. This is super important. I'm already taking for granted that I'm way more fired up about it than you are. So anybody else uh, right over here on this side? Raise your hand if you don't mind. Here we go. Replacement theology. Please write it down. Anybody? Everybody good? Everybody good? Everybody good? Okay. So make sure. If you need something, let me know. Replacement theology is based on two premises. Here we go. Number one. And again, these slides will be up on the website. Number one, God has permanently rejected national Israel. That's the first tenet. In other words, this is what we believe about it, and so we're going to come into every passage understanding this idea, which is real interesting, because when you get into the idea of blessings and cursings in Deuteronomy 27 and 28, everybody wants to embrace the blessings and say, no, 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 that's for the church. But in, but in passage, in chapter 28, they say, oh, well the, well, the cursings, that's for national Israel. They're cursed. They're cursed. That's golden corral theology. You can't just pick the good little puffy muffin things or whatever and leave your Brussels sprouts. You can't do that. Number two, the church has replaced or superseded Israel in God's plan. There's no future for Israel. In other words, every time that the idea of church is brought up in the New Testament from now on, And of course, they let you know whether it's valid or whether it's not valid. But it's actually speaking of a continuation of national Israel, now known as spiritual Israel or new Israel. Strange. In fact, some people even say the Old Testament church or they'll talk about covenant people and what they mean is the church. The end result is that the church has become the inheritor of God's covenant blessings originally given to Israel. And Israel will not be restored as a nation with a distinct identity and function. Now, here's the reason why we disagree with that. And I'm going to try to not sound smart, Alec, even though that is my spiritual gift. It really comes down to no other point except the fact that we know how to read. I know that sounds silly. But how many, whenever you were reading Lord of the Rings, anybody read Lord of the Rings? Okay, you saw Frodo, you thought that was Bilbo. Anybody? That just doesn't happen, does it? Some of you don't have a clue what I'm talking about. Okay. When Jack and Jill went up the hill, is there any reason that we should have thought that was Norm and Betty? No. So why change their names? It makes no sense, does it? How many were sealed in Revelation 7? And who were they? Now watch this. Go to the next one, Mitch. This is a quote by a guy named Kevin DeYoung. Kevin DeYoung is one of the most popular up-and-coming reformed Calvinistic preachers, theologians, whatever you want to say nowadays. He pastors a large church in North Carolina. He's highly called on for meetings, writing books, and everything. A lot of stuff that he's been writing lately is, for instance, how Christians should keep the law. That should be concerning to you. Uh, Relooking at the Synod of Dort, which deals with the five points of Calvinism and why that's important for us to understand, how we should be devoted to creeds as a church. And all of it bypasses a clear reading of the scriptures. Here's what he says. The 144,000 are not an ethnic Jewish remnant. How? Notice what else he says here. And certainly not an anointed class of saints who became Jehovah's Witnesses before 1935. Now to that we would agree and say amen. The 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Stop. Everybody see what he just did? He quoted the passage that he's telling you that's not what it plainly says. Look what he says here. Represent the entire community of the redeemed. Everybody know what he just did? Exactly. Spiritual Israel. It's obviously the church. It's obviously redeemed people. Now, he gives a lot of reasons as to why this is true. I've only listed down three that I thought would be really fun for us to play with, okay? So here's the first thing. First, in chapter 13, we read that Satan seals all of his followers. So it makes sense that God would seal all of his people, not just the Jewish ones. When's the last time that God ever did something because Satan did it first? (laughs) Does everybody see that that is strange thinking? 
If anything, from what we know in going through Scripture, we see that Satan is the great imitator and deceiver of everything that God has done. He's the one who's given you the 98% of truth, and then he slips in the 2% of deception in order to get us off track. So to say that Satan is setting the pace and God is following along, it's scary. How about the next one? Number two. The image of sealing comes from Ezekiel 9, and it does where the seal on the forehead marks out two groups of people, idolaters and non-idolaters. Does anybody want to guess who the idolaters and non-idolaters were part of the same common group of in Ezekiel 9? Israel. So notice this. It would seem that the sealing of the 144,000, and I think the word you need to be concerned about is it would seem, it would seem that the 144,000 make a similar distinction based on who worships God, not who among the Jewish remnant worships God. That's scary. Here's his fourth point that he brought up. The third one was kind of eh. Fourth, the 144,000 mentioned later in chapter 14 are those who have been redeemed from the earth. Let me ask you a question. Can Jewish people be redeemed from the earth? Yes, they can. So notice this, and those who were purchased from among men, can Jewish people be purchased from among men? Absolutely they can. This is generic. Everybody everybody kind of language. The 144,000 is a symbolic number of redeemed drawn from all people, not simply the Jews. Besides, if the number is not symbolic, then what do we do with Revelation 14.4, which describes the 144,000 as those who have not defiled themselves with women? Are we to think that the 144,000 refer to a chosen group of celibate Jewish men? Yes! Well, how in the world could you possibly come to that conclusion? Because that's what Jesus told me he wanted me to know about it. Because whenever it is revealing everything that he wants to tell us about the end of the world and how each point is going to play out in unfolding his coming again, this is what he wants me to know about it. I don't get to manipulate that. I take his word for what it says and I deal with it in context. Notice what he says after that. It makes more sense. Stop. What did he just tell you? Logic trumps reading. That's what he just told me. Instead of just taking it at face value for what it says, it's better for you to just think of it this way. It makes more sense to realize that 144,000 is a symbolic number that is described as celibate men who highlight the group's moral purity and set-apartness for spiritual battle. Does anybody else think this is just off? It's disturbing. Because here's the conclusion that you come to. Whatever God's telling me in the word, I can't trust it. Because if Israel really means church, if 144,000 means a round number of some significance we don't know, and if ethnic Jewish celibate men, 144,000 from each tribe, actually means the redeemed, well, who's to say that the cross means the cross? And who's to say that the resurrection means rising from the dead? And who's to say that Jesus is the Lamb of God doesn't really mean that he's the cheetah cat of South Africa? It makes no sense. Does everybody see how crazy this is? Now, I'm going to say this, understanding that Kevin DeYoung is a brother in Christ. Does everybody see how heretical this is? We talk about heresy, and it's a, it's a strong word because it means to divide, to bring division in a situation. But this is, this is problematic. This is problematic beyond understanding. Because if you, took his, if you took his viewpoints about it, here's what it's saying. You can't read the Bible for yourself, and so therefore I need to tell you which each of these entities are, what it means, how you should understand it, how you should better think about these things. Does anybody else know of an entity in the world that does that? They're called the Catholic Church. And it's not very far from this. So this is why this situation is so dire, and this is why we are taking this understanding of saying, as people who believe that God has worked certain ways in certain times as the Bible unfolds itself, and he desires to be known, so therefore we read his word for what it plainly says, and we let the word give us our theology, rather than taking our already held theology and reading it into the Bible, we need to be moldable people so that we can believe God for what he says in his word. I don't know of any way else to understand it than that. To me, and I'll go ahead and put that out there, 
That makes the most common sense in the world. Can you trust what God has said? Turn to Genesis 12 with the question of can we trust what God has said? The question that we're asking is, is not what is written. We're going to see that. But is it literally trustworthy? Can you literally believe what God has literally said? Genesis chapter 12. You're probably familiar with this. If you remember this from foundational framework, yes, we've gone over this before. But this is an important foundational relationship that goes on in Scripture that we have to understand, or we will not understand the full counsel of God. It's impossible. Verse 1, Now Yahweh said to Abram, Go forth from your country. Remember, he was a pagan idol worshiper in Ur of the Chaldeans, down by the Persian Gulf, when God called him. He says, Now Yahweh said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. If you are somebody who writes in your Bible, Jesus is okay with it. I've talked with him, okay? But if you want to write in your margin there, land, all caps, it's important for you to understand. Abram is being promised by Almighty Creator God a land that will be his real estate. It says here, and I will make you a great nation. In other words, I'm going to give you a lot of offspring. offspring. Now, Abram's in his late 70s at this point. So this is interesting. And I remember we talked about anybody here that's over 70, plan on having kids. None of you were. I was disappointed. But notice, and I will make you a great nation, that seed or descendants, and I will bless you. So God is going to bring blessing upon Abram. And look at what it says, and make your name great. So Abram is going to have this renown that goes on in history. And so you shall be a blessing. In other words, he is to be a blessing to other people that he comes in contact with. Verse 3, and I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. Does everybody see that? Does God tell the truth? These are divine promises, guys. If you're wondering what the polls are going to look like next year for the Christian vote, I encourage you, base it off the promises of God. What candidates are blessing Israel? Not saying that they condone sin. We know from the Old Testament, Israel sins just like the rest of us does. And we should never be okay with sin. We should hate sin, but we should love the sinner. We should still love the nation because they are God's chosen people. It's clear right here in this point. In fact, these three verses right here settle a whole lot of dispute if we would just believe them for what they literally say. So notice, I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. If you want to write in your margin, worldwide blessing. Notice, this is what is called the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant. And it's got three points to it. Number one, we are talking about land. It is real estate. Why? Because God is going to set up a kingdom. And let's be honest, you're going to put a kingdom somewhere. You need real estate, right? So you get those realtors on the phone. You say, find me a place for kingdom. (laughs) We got your plot of land right across the highway here. Set it up there. But that's not what it says, right? Where is he going to rule from? Where is the Lord going to rule from? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. In fact, that's the interesting thing about it. We already know what it is. And here's the reason why. If God's promise is steadfast and sure, and if this land belongs to the Jewish people, then we know a crazy man with the bomb is not going to destroy everything and thwart history. Does everybody see that? There's a lot of threats that we fall under when Christians could just sit back as cool as cucumbers, say, God's got this. Why worry about this? Number two, we deal with the idea of seed. There needs to be subjects for the kingdom. It's not just setting up a kingdom, but it's having people to fill it. This is a promise right here that you are going to have literal, physical, earthly people that are going to have rights to this kingdom. Number three, we deal with the idea of worldwide blessing. In other words, there's going to be a king who saves. And he's not just a king who saves just the Jewish people. He's a king that has taken sin of every person and has died for it. He's a satisfaction for our sins, not for our sins only, but for the sins of the entire world. He pays the sin debt. 
This is why us sharing the gospel with people in our lives is so important. Sin's not the issue anymore, guys. Jesus already paid for it. The issue is unbelief. And unless they hear the gospel, they cannot believe. That's why we are all missionaries to the world. That's important for us to understand. Can we still believe what God has literally said? Move with me over to Genesis 15. There's a lot here. I encourage you to read it in your own time. Let me give you a, a summation of what's going on. Well, man, look at the time. Mm. I think we can do it. You think we can do it? We can do it. Yeah, man, where's this gung-ho, amazing attitude come? The spirit is alive here. You guys all need glory fans too. We're going to the Dollar Tree and getting it. Anybody notice that nobody prices anything at the Dollar Tree? Does anybody think that's weird? My wife gets so mad at me. We'll be in an aisle and out of nowhere I'll go, how come there are no prices on this thing? And she just looks at me and just, Nathaniel, sit in the cart. Stop it, dad. So I think that's hilarious. Whatever. And here's the thing. No lie. Real quick. I went in there one time and bought something. It was 69 cents. I was really mad they didn't price stuff at that point. I was like, you better charge me. Never mind. Anyway, moving on. All right. Verse one. After these things, the word of Yahweh came to Abram in a vision saying, do not fear Abram. I am your shield. I'm a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. And, and remember, we talk about the names of God, how important it is to recognize how the translators have put this in English. Abram said, oh, Adonai Yahweh. Remember, Adonai means master. Yahweh means I am the self-existing one, okay? But notice, he is really humbling himself before the Lord at this point. He's saying, master, self-existent one, is the idea here. What will you give me since I am childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. In other words, notice that Abram is concerned about the promise of the seed. Does everybody see that? I don't have any kids yet, and I'm old. He's 98 at this point. It's kind of crazy. So notice, moving on here. Verse 3, and Abram said, Since you've given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of Yahweh came to him, saying, The man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body. He shall be your heir. And he took him outside and said, I love it, God's a great illustrator. Now look toward the heavens and count the stars if you're able to count them. Everybody see this? Think about it. Think about being there and just watching what's going on. Count the stars if you are able to number them. And here's what he says. And he said to him, Show, so shall your descendants be. Now, if you have a New American Standard Version, everybody see the word descendants there. You should have a little marker next to it. What does it say? Seed. Seed. S-E-E-D. Keep that. It's, it's consistent throughout your Old Testament, the idea. And why is that? It's not just because they wanted to phrase it out that way. It's because Moses, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in writing this down at God's discretion, wants to constantly bring to your mind Abrahamic covenant, Abrahamic covenant, Abrahamic covenant, Abrahamic covenant, over and over and over. Why? Because let's be honest, God is only as good as his promises, yes? What if God lied to you? Would you think less of him? You'd have to, wouldn't you? You wouldn't have a choice. Disappointment like that would be crushing for us. And so notice, everything about history rests upon whether God really meant what he said or whether he was just playing or whether we should twist that into meaning something else. The, the consequences here are important. The ramifications of this not coming out as God has said are dire to the very breath we have every day. How can you live in any kind of confidence if you can't trust the creator of all things? It's impossible. And so God has to be held accountable to his word. That is the standard. Now watch what happens here. He takes him out, shows him the stars. So shall your descendants be, verse 6. Then he believed in Yahweh, and he reckoned it to him. He assigned value to it. He imputed it. He incredited it to him as righteousness. How were people saved in the Old Testament? Not by keeping the law. People were saved in the Old Testament the same way they're saved in the New Testament, by believing what God has said, period. This is what God showed Abram. Abraham believed it, and immediately God gives a declaration of righteousness in Abram's account. Everybody see that? It's pretty plain, yes? Who's asleep? Need coffee? Okay, we're good. Verse 7, and he said to him, I am Yahweh who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this, what is it? Land to what? 
possess it. Now, if you've been spending time with us in Deuteronomy for Sunday school, you know that every time you see the word possess, it actually is talking about the word what? Inherit. It's the idea of inheriting it. This is a land that you will receive because it has been promised to you by God, and you may not get it at this time, but your people will get it. Now, watch what happens here. You're going to possess it. Verse 8, and he said, oh, and watch how he does it again, Adonai Yahweh, master, self-existent one. How may I know that I will possess, that I will inherit it? Now, notice, we were talking about the seed, verses 1 through 6. Now, 7 to 21, we're talking about land. We're talking about real estate. We're talking about everything that springs off of the basic promise that was given in chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And look what happens here. So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat and a three-year-old ram and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two, cut them down the middle and laid each half opposite on the other. So imagine that one half is over here and one half is over here and there is a pathway in between these sacrifices in order to walk. And the reason is, is because back when somebody made a contract agreement, when two parties came to an agreement about something today, I mean, we would of course sign with the bank, you know, we're going to pay you this, you're going to give me the money for my house kind of thing, right? If you're in a gang, you're spitting on your hand and shaking hands or cutting it or whatever blood I don't know but whatever you would do to come to some sort of agreement well this is God condescending himself to operate in terms that Abram is going to understand and he understood the idea of splitting an animal down cutting it in two and then the two parties would walk in between these two laid apart animals here in order to solidify their part of this agreement does everybody get that okay so now let's watch what happens it streams from this It says, verse 11, the birds of prey, that's vultures, came down upon the carcasses and Abram drove them away. Now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. And God said to Abram, know for certain that your descendants, your what? Your seed. Everybody remember, put that together, put that together in your mind. Your seed will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and opposed, sorry, and oppressed 400 years. What's he talking about there? Egypt. He's talking about the Egyptian captivity. So notice, God is already telling him the future of what it's going to look like for these people. Now, moving on to verse 14. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterwards they will come out with many possessions. In other words, the exodus. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You will be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation, they will return here. Now, now pay attention to what he's doing here. For the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. Now, if you need more information about the iniquity of the Amorites, you can read the first four chapters of Deuteronomy. If you're familiar with Sihon, he's an Amorite. Uh, essentially, they were pagans, and, and, and what it seems to be here is that each nation, each people group, almost have like a cup. And as they sin and as they commit atrocities against the Lord, that cup becomes filled, and when it gets to the brim, God judges. That seems to be the idea that takes place throughout Scripture. We don't want to get hung up on that right now, but it's something interesting, just mind candy to put in there. Uh, verse 17, it came about when the sun had set that it was very dark. Now watch this. And behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch, which passed between the pieces. On that day, Yahweh made a covenant with Abram. Now pause for a second. Everybody noticed that Abram didn't pass through the pieces. Which, what does that tell you about this covenant? It is all based upon the faithfulness of God to do what God said he would do. Does everybody see that? God's word is really on the line here about whether or not he really means what he said, whether or not he can really deliver what he said he is going to do. And because Abram doesn't pass through the pieces, he is not responsible for upholding any side of the covenant. This is because the Abrahamic covenant is an unconditional covenant. There are no conditions upon it coming to fruition. Does everybody get that? Yes? How many of you, this is old hat for you? You get this. Okay, good, good. For the rest of you, I'm preaching to you. Everybody else go to sleep. Okay. So notice verse 18 saying, to your descendants, I have given this what? Land. And notice he's going to give you the boundaries for this land. From the river of Egypt, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. What's the river in Egypt? The Nile. We should all know that just because we know about Egypt, right? That's kind of what you know about Egypt over there. They have the Nile all the way to the Euphrates. What does Euphrates run into? 
Iraq, yes, but, but what body of water? The Persian Gulf, exactly. So right now in our minds, we can, we can almost picture the idea of what the boundaries of this land are. Notice it says here, the Kenite, the Kenizzite, the Cadmonite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Rephaim, the Amorite, that was mentioned up in verse 16, the Canaanite and the Girgashite and the Jebusite. In other words, just in case you didn't know what boundaries I was telling you about, let me tell you about all the people that currently live there. All that land is going to be yours. Is this a pretty steep promise? I think it is. In fact, only God could keep it. Now, here's the interesting thing. Look over to chapter 17, verse 19. This is a reiteration of the seed dimension of the promise. And look what he says, verse 19. But Elohim said, no, but Sarah, your wife, talking to Abram, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. Now watch this. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his what? Seed after him. Notice what God just did. You're going to have a son, just like I told you, you're going to have a son. He is going to be directly from you and Sarah. You're going to call his name Isaac. And just as I made this promise with you, this unconditional promise, we are going to pass it on to him. And now this promise is going to be with him. And everyone that comes from him, it's going to be from them as well. Everybody see that God is really, he he keeps heightening the stakes. It's no longer that I got to fulfill three little things with one person. Now I got to do it with his offspring. And we're not going to stop there. We're going to do it with the people that come through Isaac afterwards as well. And oh, by the way, I'm going to use the word everlasting just to make it almost impossible for anybody else but the creator to do. Does everybody see that? In fact, if you don't have everlasting covenant marked in that verse, mark it. Mark it real quick. It's It's a good, good word. How about this? Turn over to... 26. Genesis 26. Genesis chapter 26. Look at verses 1 through 4. Thank you for bringing your Bibles today. I I love hearing the pages rustle. It's good. Verse 1. Now there was a famine in the land besides the previous famine that had occurred in the days of Abraham. So Isaac went to Gerar to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. Yahweh appeared to him and said, do not go down to Egypt. Stay in the what? the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. Everybody see the blessing? For to you and to your seed, I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath. Now watch these words. I will establish the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. Everybody see the idea of land there? Notice, swear, Oath, powerful words. And notice, just in case there's not any question about what's going on here, what I told Abraham in 12, 1 through 3, and what I told him in all of chapter 15, I'm not telling to you. We're now transferring that also to you. This promise is still sure and steadfast. Look what it says in verse 4. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and I will give your descendants all these lands, and by your, what is it? Seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Land, seed, blessing. Does everybody see it? Land, seed, blessing. Now passed on to Isaac. Now we look over at Jacob. Look over in Genesis 28, 13 through 15. Genesis 28, verses 13 through 15. And behold, Yahweh stood above it. Now this is when Jacob had the dream, the ladder came down, angels descending and ascending around, okay? And notice it says, And behold, Yahweh stood above it and said, I am Yahweh, the Elohim, now watch this, of your father who? Abraham, and the Elohim of? Isaac, Jacob's daddy, okay? The land on which you lie, I will give it to you and to your seed. Mark it. Land, seed. Now it went from Abraham to Isaac, now to Jacob. He's transferring these promises. He is keeping his covenant. He is watching it trail through history, through the progeny of Abraham. It says here, your descendants, your seed, will also be like the dust of the earth. Everybody see that? Mark that. That's important because we're going to show you where that's fulfilled. Okay, it's going to be like the dust of the earth, stars of the sky, the idea. You will be spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and in your seed with all the families of the earth will be blessed. 
I'm sorry, I don't think I said that right. And in you and in your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Land, seed, blessing. Everybody see this over and over again. Watch, we keep going here. Verse 15, behold, I'm with you and I will keep you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised to you. Now, at this moment for Jacob, if you're familiar with Jacob's story, this seemed like a complete impossibility for him. But here's what God, here's what God is saying constantly. Trust me. Trust me. Believe what I say. When I make you a promise, I will fulfill it. May not be how quickly you want it, but wait on me. He's not slow. Come on, God. Hurry it up. Sometimes we treat God and theology like we're ordering at McDonald's. We go around to the window, give me my bag and get out of here kind of thing. We can't afford to do that with him. He works in his own time. He works at perfect time. Now, here's the interesting thing about this whole idea with the seed. Turn with me to Deuteronomy 1. It's one thing for God to make a promise. It's one thing for God to make a promise to another group of people or or somebody else like Isaac. It's a Another thing for him to reiterate it again to Jacob, Isaac's son, but it's a whole nother deal for him to fulfill it. So you, you, you guys ever known the person that talks a good game but just couldn't deliver? If you're thinking of me, shame on you. But you're probably right, actually. Verse 10, chapter 1 of Deuteronomy, verse 10. Yahweh your Elohim, this is Moses talking to Israel, has multiplied you, and behold, you are this day like the stars of heaven in number. You know what that's called? Fulfilled promise. That is God fulfilling his promise. Your descendants will be as many as the sands on the shore, as many as the stars in the sky. Count them if you're able. Deuteronomy 1.10, God has fulfilled the promise of seed. Does everybody see this? And, and, and we know this today, right? Jewish populations even that have migrated to America. They're everywhere, are they not? Everywhere. We know that. We know that. God's people are still there. His promises are still valid for them. The church hasn't replaced it. Good grief. What a ragtag bunch we are thinking if we've got some sort of precedence in these types of blessings and promises. It's silly. Who gave us the right to interpret Scripture that way? Makes no sense. Go to Deuteronomy 9. Because I think this is important to show you the unconditional nature of of the promise, and God has no problem reminding them of this situation. Deuteronomy chapter 9, starting in verse 5. It is not for your righteousness or for the uprightness of your heart that you are going to possess or inherit this land. Everybody notice the lands in view. But it's because of the wickedness of these nations that Yahweh your Elohim is driving them out before you. Now watch this. In order to confirm the oath which Yahweh swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Does everybody see it? The reason why you're going to be led into this land at this moment is because I am going to bring the promise that I gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to fulfillment. I'm going to do what I said I was going to to do. That's what he's getting at here. Look at verse 6. Know then, it is not because of your righteousness. Oh, well, God, when we're good enough, you'll let us in. Do you guys realize that there's actually a belief about the end of the world that says that the world is going to get better and better and better and better? And then at some point, it's going to be so good, Jesus can't help but to return. Does that strike anybody as odd? (laughs) Me too. (laughs) But think about that. Can you imagine sitting back going, ah, I know it seems bad now, but you just wait. We're all going to get our act together. It's going to be really awesome. Jesus is going to come back because he wants to be with us. Scary. Okay. So look at verse 6 again. Know then, it's not because of your righteousness that Yahweh your Elohim is giving you this good land to possess, to inherit, for you are a stubborn people. Don't you love that God always tells you the truth? I love it. Let's not think we're off the hook either. I'm sure you and I are stubborn people. Good grief. I'm prideful. It makes me sick. But notice, it's not because how good you are. It's not because how well you do. It's because God promised it. And that's why God is going to do it. In other words, his words what holds fast. Now, here's what's interesting. Go to the end of the book, 34, Deuteronomy 34. 
This is actually where Moses dies. We're not going to read that part, but this is, the, this is leading into this. You'll see the little heading above your, your chapter. Deuteronomy 34, verses 1 through 4 is what we're going to look at. Now Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. Now, if, you're, if you can think with me real quick, just imagine, or if you want to look at a map in the back of your Bible, imagine, if you're looking at a map of the Middle East and you're going to see the Mediterranean Sea here, you're going to see all the land of Canaan stretched out here, then you know that you'll have the Salt Sea, the Dead Sea down here, Jordan River that runs up, Sea of Galilee here. This mountain is actually located on this side of the Jordan River. They weren't calling it the Jordan at that time, but they're there. And Moses is able to go up on the front, and when he gets up at the top, he's able to look at the entire expanse of land. He's able to take a whole look. In fact, look what it says about it. It says here, uh, and the Lord Yahweh showed him all the land, Gilead, as far as Dan. Now, just so you know, Dan inherited the northern region, so that means that Moses had 1520 vision or something, okay? He was able to see incredible, the entire north to south, full expanse of it. Verse 2, and all Naphtali and the land of Ephraim and Manasseh and all the land of Judah as far as the Western Sea. The Western Sea there, if you see the note, it's the Mediterranean Sea. He could stand on this mountain, see all the way across the expanse and view the Mediterranean Sea on the other side of it. Pretty, pretty amazing, okay? Now remember, because of Moses' sin, because he didn't believe God, because when God said, speak to the rock to give the people water, and he struck the rock, God disqualified him from entering this land. And so that's why Moses wasn't able to go. But in his grace, he allowed for Moses to go to the top of the mountain and to look over to see what the children of Israel that he had led for the past 40 years was going to inherit, where they were going to go in. Verse 3, And the Negev and the plain in the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zor, then Yahweh said to him, This is the land which I swore to, mark it, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will give it to your seed. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. In other words, notice that Yahweh is recalling his promise. Genesis 12 and 15, Abraham. Genesis 26, Isaac. Genesis 28, Jacob. Does everybody see this? We see the common thread being woven through these things. 2 Kings 13, this is an interesting incident here. 2 Kings 13. I want to look at verses 22 and 23. 2 Kings 13, verses 22 and 23. It says, Now Haziel, king of Aram, now just so you know real quick who this is, these are the Syrians. If that gives you an idea, a group of people, it's the Syrians. It says here, Had oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoahaz. Now Jehoahaz was the king of Judah in that time. He had reigned for 17 years. So you had these people, the Syrians, were constantly pounding on Judah for 17 years, okay? This entire time. Look what it says in verse 23. Now watch, pay attention to the language because we would, we, we would do it shame in order to just read through it quickly. Pay attention to what's going on. But Yahweh was gracious to them and had compassion on them. He had mercy and he turned to them. Because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now watch this. And would not destroy them or cast them from his presence until now. Or some of your translations will say, even to this day. What's going on here? Does anybody know? The Syrians for 17 years have been hammering away at Judah. But it says that Yahweh had compassion on them. He was gracious to them. He turned to them because of his covenant. He would not allow them, or he would not destroy them, or cast them from his presence. What does this mean? Do we know? It means because of this attack by the Syrians that was mounted against them, Israel should have become an extinct nation. That the battle was so fierce that they were just pummeled continuously. Israel should have died that day is what it means. But why didn't they? Well, because God was gracious and compassionate and he turned to them. And why did he turn to them? Because they deserved it? No, if that's the case, we don't know our history about 2 Kings. But why did he do it? 
because he made an unconditional promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And because his promise will come to fulfillment, he spares them. He so orchestrates the battle in such a way as to where he preserves the Jews, Judah at this time, from becoming a non-people. Does everybody see how important that is? In other words, defeat was certain until God took up his promise and dealt with it. This is important, man. Because what this says, and this is the nature of an unconditional promise. We're going to look at it and say, man, this, that's, that's not fair. You know, we wouldn't say that if we were playing a game of Monopoly, would we? I got more property and more money than this person. I should beat them. Yeah, but God made a covenant with the other person. So you're going to lose before you ever start. I don't know, Christians ever play Monopoly? Man, you talk about disunity in the church. Good gravy. It's dangerous. But here's the thing. God was on their side. God already made a promise. God's word was already there, and it cannot be denied. Serious, serious stuff. Let's turn this last one, Jeremiah. I left my paper up here. Jeremiah 33, last one. You guys have been patient walking through this. Thank you. I hope you're seeing the significance of why literal interpretation, understanding the Bible, taking it for just what it says it says, Not reading into it, not manipulating it, not doing anything strange to it. 33, we're going to look at verses 23 through 26. I'm sorry, Mitch, I think maybe I I put in the wrong verse. 23 through 26. Jeremiah 33, 23 through 26. And this is actually the, the earlier part of this passage we're going to deal with next week as well because we're going to talk about the promise made to David. Verse 23, And the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah, saying, Have you not observed what this people have spoken? Now, here's what's going on, just so I can get you into it. There's gossip going on amongst the pagan nations. They're all talking about Yahweh's relationship with Israel and Judah, what that looks like. And here's what he says. Here's what they're saying. The two families, the two families are Israel and Judah because the kingdom was split, which Yahweh chose. He has rejected them. Now notice, because God doesn't allow sin to go, because God will definitely discipline his children when they sin in such a way that never breaks his promises towards them. It had seemed, for all intents and purposes, that the nations had come to the conclusion, well, God chose them, but they didn't last very long. Guess God isn't much of a God to keep his promises. Guess he can't really do what he says. Guess he's not really better than Mordok and Baal and, and Ashtaroth and all these other gods that we know around here. He's just like one of them. And so God doesn't like gossip. God doesn't like gossip, especially that infringes upon his character and renders something that he's clearly spoken as not being true. And that's why this issue of replacement theology and this idea that the church is really Israel is so important and why I take it so seriously. Look what it says here. Thus they despise my people. In other words, they're looking down on Israel and Judah because of it. No longer are they as a nation in their sight. They don't revere them anymore as a respected people. Verse 25, thus says Yahweh, if my contract, if my covenant for day and night stand not. In other words, if the sun stops shining and the stars stop appearing is the idea. Look what he says here. And the fixed patterns of heaven and earth. In other words, if the laws of the universe fail, I have not established, then I would reject the what? Nope. Seed. The seed of Jacob and David, my servant. Not taking from his seed rulers over the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob but I will restore their fortunes and I and will have mercy on them. In other words, the local gossip was running the risk of making Yahweh to be a liar. And here's what God says. You would have to stop the sun. You would have to stop the stars. You would have to get rid of the moon. You would have to disturb the orbit of the planets. You would have to thwart the sun in order to make what I have promised towards these people not possible. Can we do that? No. Is our Kevin DeYoung is a powerful man. 
That's the conclusion. That's the application for today. <laughs> now, let me ask you this question, because here's what I'm overwhelmed with. Do we not serve a great God? How often have I walked in my life not even paying attention to his promises when all of his promises are already certain and sure? When everything that he has ever spoken on my behalf, and how do we know this? I'll tell you what, the greatest manifestation of his promises towards us is in the person of Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ is not a certainty, a seal on a promise for you and me, I don't know what is. Because what he did on that cross was everything that God said he would do. He paid it all. He took care of every bit of it. The one who believes in him will not perish, but has everlasting life. Should I conclude that, that we'll only live a little bit longer than we normally should? See, you can't afford to distort scripture. We cannot afford as a people who live in a sinful age with as drug ridden as this city is, with as terrifying as what it looks like is coming on the horizon, with as hopeless as this world is painting things, with all of the false gods that people love to rise up and think that there's hope found in them, we cannot afford to set aside the sure promises of God. And here's what he said, page after page after page. I am telling you the truth. I am telling you the truth. Trust me, trust me, trust me. God's hand is always extended for people to grab onto. Let me ask you the question, are you holding it today? I'm not asking if you're going to heaven when you die. I'm concerned about that as well. But I want to know as a believer in Jesus Christ, if God is on the shelf until Sunday, or if you recognize that as we move throughout this life, he needs to be ever before you. He needs to be ever before me all the time. He needs to be the crosshairs of every situation that I look at. Why? Because his promises are sure. Because he does not lie. Because he cannot change. Does everybody see this? I hope that pierces your heart this morning. I hope that causes you to stop for a second and maybe gain a, a, a an ounce of sobriety about maybe some place where we've thought foolishly about, or we thought for some way we could just handle it on our own. We thought, oh, well, I know I'll just call on my best friend, right? They'll help me out. No one loves you more than Jesus. No one has promised you greater things than Jesus. And if we ever needed proof of it, the track record of God's faithfulness with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has been testified over and over again. Everybody good? Let's pray. I'm hot. Can't help it. Father God, thank you that your promises are sure, perfect, just as you said, not deviating in any way, not needing any sort of linguistic manipulation. They don't need to be reinterpreted in light of current events. They don't need to be twisted to fit our current mindset. Father, you give us truth and you tell us how to think. For whatever reason, we would ever think that we are in the driver's seat. Lord, I pray that we're sorry. I pray that our hearts are tender before you, recognizing where we've been presumptuous and wrong or haughty and prideful or lying or simply that we've not handled your word well. God, we know you want us to know you. you. You've given us your word. You've given all of us a copy of the Bible. And you beckon us to know you. And if you want us to know anything about you, it's the fact that you tell the truth all the time. Father, thank you for a consistent historical record that testifies to your faithfulness. I pray, God, we love you more and more because of this fact. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.